Hello. Uh, welcome to the week four Ask Mark session. Um, as you will all know, we had a technical problem last week. And so this is a retake um, of those questions, of the questions for week four. Um, here they go. Um, the first question um, arose from a complicated uh, to and fro discussion um, over the question of consciousness. Um, the, the, the main issue seemed to be um, a sort of incredulity uh, around the claims that I was making about such a lowly primitive brainstem structure being the font of consciousness. Um, and then that discussion culminated in this question, which was chosen by the mentors. And the question goes like this. If the periaqueductal gray is the seat of feeling and consciousness, that is to say the PAG produces consciousness in a way that oranges produce juice, then is there something remarkably different in the physical structure of the PAG compared to other parts of the brain? And if so, what? So I'm going to answer that question but um, in the way that I answer it, I'm going to uh, bear in mind the uh, discussion that I referred to um, about the question of consciousness and the brainstem more broadly. So to begin with, yes, the PAG does have um, properties which relate to its function um, uh, re regarding consciousness. But there's nothing magical about those properties. And they're also not entirely unique to the PAG. Um, we must remember that the PAG is, is, is just one in a network of structures in the upper brainstem, uh, all of which are involved in generating consciousness. Um, so what I'm going to say, first of all, applies to all of those structures. They are, uh, they, they are nuclei in the upper brainstem which send long axons into the forebrain, into the higher brain structures. And they, those long axons project diffusely in the forebrain. And uh, if you think about it, this makes sense in relation to what they're doing, because what they're doing is activating the whole of the forebrain. So they need widespread access to forebrain neurons, and that's exactly what they do. Then secondly, there's also a lot of projection back to those arousal structures from the forebrain. And this applies particularly to the PAG. The PAG has massive inputs from all over the brain. Um, and very interestingly is right next to the PAG in a structure called the tectum, which is just behind it. Uh, there is, a, by dint of these backward projections, these projections back down from the forebrain, there is a little map a complete map of the body. Uh, this is a crude map, much more rudimentary than the beautifully detailed maps that we get in the cortex. Uh, this seems to be a sort of precursor, a brainstem vertebrate equivalent of what will later, uh, when the cortex um, uh, evolved, what will later become these detailed, precise representations um, of all of our sensory modalities. Why this is important is that the PAG uh, is not just a structure which um, generates consciousness, uh, uh, affective consciousness. It's that that consciousness guides behavior. That's, in fact, what it's there for. And so the PAG has direct access to this primitive little um, um, homunculus, if you will, this little mannequin uh, in the brainstem, which is, which is um, in turn connected to the body. So the PAG is also a motor structure. It also has these um, uh, peremptory effects on our, on our actions, on what we do. Now, as I said, none of that is magical. It makes sense that the upper brainstem should be broadly connected to the forebrain, um, and this is because it activates the forebrain. Now we come to the question of, you know, does it, uh, does it uh, am I really claiming that consciousness can be reduced to the activities of those structures. So now I'm changing gear and I have to make a very fundamental point. The whole purpose of this course, What is a Mind, is try, uh, we're trying to identify the most fundamental properties of 
a men of, of the mental, of the mind. In other words, I am indeed trying to reduce things down to their most basic level. That's not to say that in us much more complicated uh, creatures uh, that that's all that the mind consists in. And by reducing it to the basics, I'm trying to find what can what criteria can we use for determining whether a mind exists in any sort of creature, indeed in any sort of thing. And uh, it's in this sense that the upper brainstem arousal structures, uh, generally known as the extended reticular thalamic activating system, or the reticular activating system for short, that these structures are the sort of um, absolutely necessary and sufficient condition for consciousness. If those structures are there, then we have every reason to believe that consciousness in its most rudimentary form uh, exists in that creature. All the evidence points uh, to that conclusion. In other words, every prediction that we make from that hypothesis is confirmed experimentally. So in that sense, I'm saying consciousness is generated by the upper brainstem, uh, the PAG being the most dramatic in instance of, of that network of nuclei. But that does not mean that that's all that consciousness consists in. So let me first of all be clear again about what sort of consciousness is generated at that level. It is a, an affective state, a feeling state, the sort of presence of a mind um, in its most basic form is just feeling. Feeling in this sense is the medium uh, of the mental. Raw feelings with no ideas necessarily attached to them. So it's a sort of a it's a sort of a subjective state which has a particular uh, affective quality. It's pleasant or it's unpleasant, and this feeling guides the animal. Uh, think of a fish uh, in a pond. Uh, it 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 moves toward what feels good and it moves away from what feels bad. But it has no idea what those things are that feel good and feel bad. It's a kind of raw feeling state uh, which 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 which. Uh, uh, governs uh, the movements of the animal and nothing more than that. Later on, uh, in higher um, brain uh, regions when they evolve, uh, and once there's the possibility of cortical mappings, cortical representations of the images that are derived from our sensory um, organs, which are not in themselves conscious, that's the important thing to remember, that a fish can receive information from its eyes, it doesn't mean that it has a visual image that it can hold in mind because it doesn't have the cortical machinery to be able to hold a visual image in mind. So the visual information guides its behavior on the basis of what it makes it feel like. But once you have cortex, then you have an image uh, and you don't only have feelings, you say, uh, if you could speak, uh, you would say, I feel like this about that. And the consciousness is then extended onto the images and this is a radically different form of consciousness. Uh, the crucial thing to um, recognize is that it is not possible to have that higher form of consciousness, what we call cognitive consciousness, uh, where you can have uh, conscious images of mental solids, of objects. It's not possible to have that sort of consciousness without the affective consciousness contributed by the brainstem. So it's in these two senses uh, that uh, affective brainstem consciousness is primary. It's primary in the sense that it comes first in evolution. Uh, the dawn of consciousness is a dawn of feeling. And then secondly, it's, it's, more, it's, it's, it's hierarchically prerequisite uh, for the higher forms of consciousness. You can't have the higher forms of consciousness uh, unless they are generated from below. The activating of those cortical structures has to come from below. Um, so consciousness, of course, as we experience it, uh, involves both of those things, the feeling uh, and what the feelings are about. Then in the case of humans, we have a third order um, of consciousness, which is provided mainly by language, which is our capacity to then reflect upon the objects in our consciousness. So it's not just having thoughts in consciousness, but being able to think about the thoughts in consciousness. And in this, and organize them, and in this symbolic, abstract way, uh, to plan our behaviors in the way that we do. Most of our cognitive consciousness, uh, as humans, uh, in fact, takes the form of a sort of inner speech, sort of. Like, now I'm going to do this. First, I must do that. If this happens, then you know, I, I will do the following, and so on. 
This is, of course, the way we experience our consciousness. But we would be misled if we start our explorations as to how consciousness works with the human um, version of it. Um, these mental solids hide all else from view. Um, one is reminded of Plato's cave. Uh, it, uh, it, it's very misleading. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's only in that sense that I'm saying that consciousness is produced by the brainstem. Now, I need to make one further point. When I say produced by the brainstem, I don't want to get lost in philosophical um, uh, um, complexities. But you must remember it is not produced in the same way as an orange produces juice. Uh, consciousness, uh, when you look at the brainstem as a physical structure, the way it's represented from the outside, you can't see the consciousness being excreted. All you see is neurotransmitters being excreted because that's what it looks like from the outside. Consciousness is embedded within subjectivity. It can only be experienced from the inside. So when I say the upper brainstem produces consciousness, what I mean is that if you are an upper brainstem, then you feel consciousness when the upper brainstem is doing its thing. From the outside, uh, when you look at it with your eyes, what you see is physiological processes. From the inside, what you feel with your feelings is consciousness. And it's that same stuff, that feeling stuff, that then extends onto your representations and enables you to feel your perceptions. That's how they become conscious. So I hope that that clarifies, uh, to some extent, um, this question of consciousness, which has uh, so exercised you um, in the discussion forums. I now move on to the second question. It goes like this. In philosophy, intentionality means the aboutness or directedness of consciousness. Thus, a belief is intentional, as is a perception or a memory. But you move quickly from this core meaning to talking of intentionality as motivated seeking. Could you please clarify why you are linking intentionality to motivation and seeking? Yes, I can. And let me first of all um, um, explain to those learners who are not, um, who are not philosophically uh, uh, um, inclined uh, that the philosophical technical meaning of the word intentionality is uh, equivalent to the sort of non-word aboutness. Uh, intentionality in Brentano, uh, Franz Brentano, who introduced this idea, Brentano's claim was the one and only property of the mental. What defines something as mental is that it is intentional. And what he means is that mental states are always about something. Um, so um, to refer to the question that was asked, you can't have a belief without saying what your belief is. What is the content of that belief? I believe, you can't just say I believe. The question uh, arises, you believe what? What do you believe? You can't say I am thinking uh, without saying what you're thinking. Uh, in fact, you can't think without the thinking being about something. And likewise, you can't perceive without the perception being about something. You can't remember without the memory being about something. And it's this property um, this directedness toward a thing um, derived from intensio in the Latin. This is what intentionality or aboutness means, philosophically speaking. Now, the questioner asks, why do I move on from that to motivated seeking? And the answer is the following. When Brentano says, uh, or when philosophers say that mental states are intentional, I, I want to know why. Why should mental states be intentional? Uh, what does it mean when we say they're intentional mechanistically? What does it tell us about what this fundamental property of the mental really is? And uh, as you know, my approach is to say, well, let's look at it from the neurological point of view. Let's see what this intentionality is all about when we look at how it's generated uh, mechanistically in the brain. And what we find is that intentional states um, are, uh, or, or mental states are directed toward objects because mental states are intentional in the colloquial sense of the word. That is to say, they are motivated. We only have thoughts because they are demands upon our mind to perform work. That Those demands come from our embodiedness. We have needs, uh, and those needs are why uh, can only be met in the outside world, by the way. And that is why our mental states, which represent our needs in the form of feelings, 
intend toward objects, intend toward things. It's because it's only in those things that we can meet our needs. So I'm saying, that answering my rhetorical question, why uh, are mental states intentional? I'm saying that mental states have to intend toward objects because that's what they're there for. Mental states, mental work um, is there um, uh, to, 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 to enable us to satisfy our needs in the outside world. That is the very job of the mind. And uh, so these upper brainstem structures, which are fundamentally connected to the state of the body, uh, intend toward representational uh, images of the outside world uh, because that's where the needs of the body can be met. Now, again, of course, I know I'm speaking in a very reductionistic way because that's how science works. You're trying to reduce things down to the most basic of mechanisms. That doesn't mean that all that we do all day long is think about our needs and how we can meet them in the outside world. But I'll tell you what, that is the fundamental structure of all of our mental activity. That's why we have mental activity at all. So the anatomy of these, ment of, of these mind-producing um, mechanisms reflects the function of those mind-producing mechanisms. The affects tend intend toward ideas, and by ideas I mean all representations. Uh, perceptual representations, that is to say images of the here and now state of the outside world, but then also filtering those through our memory, through, our re through what we've learned from experience about the outside world, which is where our beliefs come from, about how, how do I meet my needs in the world, how, how does the world work. We are only interested in how the world works uh, because that's where we uh, can uh, satisfy our, um, the, uh, the demands, uh, the problems that our feelings pose for us all the time. So I hope that clarifies uh, why I jump from the philosophical, technical, narrow definition of intentionality or aboutness to this more general um, meaning of intentionality uh, related as it is to motivation, to will, to desire, uh, to spontaneity, to initiative, um, etc. Okay, the point is that without that, you don't have a mind. Question three. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 